Revelation chapter 10 records three very unusual things. First, John hears information about the future, yet he's forbidden to write it down for us. Second, John learns that a mystery is about to be finished, but he doesn't tell us what that mystery is. Third, he eats a book that turns his stomach. Then he's told to prophesy about its bitter predictions, bitter things that some of us just might escape. How does all of this help us today? This chapter, Revelation 10, helps us to trust God for unseen future things in our lives. Second, it helps us to be thankful to God for saving many of us Gentiles, so many. And third, it helps us to turn others from the coming bitter tribulation to a sweet ah, time with Jesus in heaven. Revelation chapter 10, some end events are sealed soon and bittersweet. So we're going to look at some things that are going to happen in the end of this world as we know it that are sealed, that are soon, and that are bittersweet. First of all, the thunders are sealed. That's verses 1 to 4. I saw another strong angel coming down out of heaven, clothed with a cloud, and the rainbow was upon his head. His face was like the sun, and his feet like pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book, which was open. He placed his right foot on the sea and his left on the land. And he cried out with a loud voice as when a lion roars. And when he had cried out, the seven peals of thunder uttered their voices. When the seven peals of thunder had spoken, I was about to write. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Seal up the things which the seven peals of thunder have spoken, and do not write them. The thunders are sealed. It begins by showing that John saw another strong angel. Now what he sees in this passage is not a continuation of the seven trumpet judgments that followed the seven seals being unleashed. Uh, chapter 10, verse 1, through chapter 11, verse 14, is kind of an interlude between the sixth trumpet judgment and the seventh trumpet judgment. Uh, now, it means... There's some things that God is going to be doing that will take place in that time spot between the judgment of the six trumpets and the final blast. Now, we left off last week looking at chapter 9 and verse 18. The sixth trumpet judgment, a third of mankind was killed. Oh my goodness, there's not much time left. I mean, we've got a third of the skies that have been darkened, a third uh, of the plants and sea life and fresh water destroyed. There can't be much time left. In 9.5, it talks about five months. Uh, and that may be all that's left here. But in between these two trumpet judgments. 
just before the return of Christ because the seventh trumpet judgment, if you look at verse 15, it sounded and there were loud voices in heaven saying the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ and he will reign forever and ever just before Jesus returns to the Mount of Olives to split it and to set up his kingdom. There's going to be these things that we get a perspective of in chapter 10 here. But there are details that are hidden from us. Mysteries that are need to be clarified for us. Events that will be bittersweet for those left on the earth. Now, this prong angel is described here in verse 1, and he's very similar to the description in chapter 1 of, of Jesus. Uh, and so I believe he's very closely associated with Jesus and has Jesus' authority to act on earth. He's clothed with a cloud, the rainbow on his head, face like the sun, feet like fire, all of that has been described in Jesus. But this angel is another angel. He's not Jesus. Uh, and in verse 6, he gets his authority from the Creator. He swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven, etc. So he's not the Creator Jesus. He is an angel who has authority and is closely related to Jesus as far as his jurisdiction over heaven and earth. He holds future information. He's got this book. Uh, Ezekiel was given a book that held information about coming judgments. And if you like, go, go to Ezekiel chapter 2. Verse 9, Then I looked, and behold, a hand was extended to me, and lo, a scroll was on it. When he spread it out before me, it was written on the front and the back, and written on it were lamentations, mourning, woe. Ezekiel lived just before the destruction of the city of Jerusalem. 586 B.C. by Nebuchadnezzar. It was a terrible time. The Book of Lamentations is, talks about all the terrible things that happened in the destruction of the temple and the burning of the temple. Oh! John has a book. It's actually a scroll that's unrolled and in it has some terrible things as well. Uh, the previous scroll in this book that had seven seals, it unleashed terrible judgments on the earth. This little book has information. <sighs> but we're not told what's in it. We're also not told what John heard when the trumpets were sounded, that there was actually words or events that could be spoken of, that were uttered. When the seven peals of thunder had spoken, I was about to write down what I saw. And yet there was another voice besides a strong angel, another angel perhaps, saying, no, John, don't write it down. In fact, make sure it's hidden. It's sealed up. Seal up the things that the seven peals of thunders have spoken and do not write them. Wow. What in the world is going on here? When there's thunder, in the previous chapters, it's kind of been an announcement to, or a warning that, hey, some judgments are coming, 6185. And this is going to be judgments because the, the sound of the angel is like a lion, and a lion doesn't roar unless he sees some prey he's about to attack. This is all about judgment it appears judgments that we don't know what they are that are going to happen on this earth to people on this earth 
it's probably something that will happen between these demonic plagues that we looked at last week and the return of our Lord right scratched before Jesus comes back in his glory and bringing wrath to set up his kingdom then. But it's an interesting thing that information about the future is sealed up in secrecy. Why, why isn't everything given for us? God's prerogative. Look at Deuteronomy 29, 29. Deuteronomy 29, 29. Let me just read the first part of this. The secret things belong to the Lord our God. There are many things that God has not revealed to us about the future, about himself that we will one day perhaps learn and understand even as we are understood. Things might even be worse in the tribulation period than, than we know of and are told here. Um, when I lived in the D.C. area, I was in contact with some folks who worked at the Pentagon and they had certain information that were need to know things in order to make their decisions. But it was only so much there was a lot that they didn't have revealed to them because of their security clearance level, etc. Um, there's some things here that we need to know. In fact, everything in the book of Revelation is given here because we need to know that these things are going to take place. So look at Revelation 22 near the end. Revelation chapter 22 and verse 10 where John has a different instruction. He said to me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book. For the time is near. We, we need to know it's going to be happening on planet Earth. We need to know there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. We have to look forward to it. affects our life today, our perspective, and our trust in coming to know Jesus as Lord and Savior, being faithful and living for Him. These are things we need to know. But we need to be able to trust God and the things he hasn't shown us. Some of us have been through tough times and that we are actually relieved we didn't know about ahead of time. Uh, and there are still future things for many of us here that it's best that we not know them beforehand. And yet, what is ahead of us? Though it's dark to us now, if we know Jesus Christ, we know that we will have His Holy Spirit to help us, that, that our Good Shepherd Jesus will lead us through these things, whatever they are. And I, I do love the 23rd Psalm. And in verse 3, He restores my soul, our Good Shepherd does. He guides me in the paths of righteousness. He's going to help me to do the right things for His name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod, your staff, they comfort me. There are things that we don't know about that are in the future that God is going to guide us through as our good shepherd. Now, we see that the end events are sealed, some, 
that they are soon, that's what we're going to look at now, and then that they're bittersweet. They are soon, the end is soon. Verses 5 through 7. Then the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land lifted up his right hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things in it and the earth and the things in it and the sea and the things in it, that there will be delay no longer. That's what he swore. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, that's the seventh trumpet angel, when he is about to sound, then the mystery of God is finished as he preached to his servants, the prophets. Right before Jesus returns, the seventh trumpet judgment, to bring his wrath and then his rule. Just before that, the mystery will be over. The mystery period. Um, now, basically what this is saying at the end of verse 6, there will be the delay no longer. Uh, is it time's up? Justice is now going to be given when you get to this part of the tribulation period. Remember justice in a sense was being delayed. Chapter 6 verse what 10 the uh, martyred believers souls in heaven are saying how long are you going to allow these people to keep, keep killing your followers Jesus. And he says until you know the rest of the Come to know me and die and are in heaven. And then, then there will be justice. How does he put it? Uh, they were told that they should rest for a little while until the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who were to be killed even as they had been would be completed also. There's more people to reach to save before I come in. Stop it all. More nations need to have representatives who are martyrs in heaven. But now, there's not going to be any delay. We're right near the end of the tribulation. Uh, in fact, after these things, the bold judgments are going to come out before Jesus returns also. And let me read chapter 16 and verse 4. Then the third angel poured out his bowl into the rivers and the springs of water. And they became blood. And I heard the angel water saying, Righteous are you who are and who were, O Holy One, because you judged these things. For they, that's the people that are being judged, that God is pouring the blood out on they poured out the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. They deserve it. So just between these demonic plagues, the fifth and sixth trumpet judgment, and the coming of Christ, we have the bowl judgments, we have the, the thunder peals, we don't know what they are, uh, but we have the fact that the last believer to be martyred is in heaven and God is just pouring out wrath and justice on these folks. Oh, what a terrible time of wrath that will be. I hope you're not here. Uh, the other thing that is there's no reason for delay is because the three and a half years of Satan being thrown to this earth and wrecking havoc and, and dwelling the Antichrist it begins with the breaking of a treaty and then there's three and a half years of Satan thrown
after the Antichrist persecuted Israel for a time, time and a half a time. In chapter 12, it mentions uh, this several times. And in chapter 12, verse 6, it's for 1,260 uh, days, which is three and a half years. Uh, Daniel talks about this period as well, half a week. But now that time is up. No more delay. God is judging. And the mystery, verse 7, will soon be over. The, then the mystery of God is finished at this point of the Lord coming back. Of no more delay. Hmm. This time when the seven bold judgments are poured out and the wrath of God comes on the earth, uh, that, that, that time will be up for making decisions. No procrastination. you got to believe before then or you're doomed. What is this mystery of God that will be finished just before Jesus sets his feet on the Mount of Olives in his return? It was a mystery that was something that was hidden in its details to the Old Testament prophets. It was a truth that had not been revealed to them, but was revealed to Paul in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 26. Uh, that is the mystery which has been hidden from the past ages and generations and now has been manifested, made known to his saints, to whom God willed to make known what is the riches of his glory of this mystery among Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. What is this mystery that is now being worked out in the age that we are in that God revealed to his prophets like Paul. Well, in Romans chapter 11, it's clarified. Romans chapter 11, verse 25. I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery so that you will not be wise in your own estimation. Here's the mystery. That a partial hearted has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. God today has hardened Jews. So there's very few that are coming to know Jesus as their Messiah, trusting in his work for them to be saved. God is hardening Jews and softening Gentiles to where the gospel of Jesus is good news is going to every Gentile tribe, people, tongue, and nation, and people are being saved from everyone. And until it reaches every last people group, um, it's going to keep going. But then, when the last group is reached, the last convert is made, that will be the end of the three and a half years. That will be the end of this mystery period of this mass Gentile salvation to where there's going to be an innumerable number of them martyred in heaven who come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And we are so fortunate to be in this age when the gospel is being proclaimed to every nation. Uh, this is something that the Old Testament prophets had a little peek of the, what was going to be at the very end of it in Isaiah chapter 59 and verse 20. Isaiah said, a redeemer is going to come to Zion and to those who turn from transgression in Jacob, declares the Lord, that will be the end when Christ comes back and they will look on him who they pierced. 
That will be the, the end of the mystery when God will then again open up the doors for Jews to be saved. So we go back to Romans 11 and verse 25, the end, a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And then, when the mystery is finished, all the Jews on earth will be saved. Just as it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant when I take away their sins. Everyone who turns to the Lord according to Joel will be saved. Daniel talks about God delivering the people at this time from the Antichrist. Uh, that is what's going to happen. Then the mystery will be finished right before Jesus comes back and the Jews see him and turn to him. So now, now is the opportunity to receive the Lord for us Gentiles. Behold, Paul says, um, now is the acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation. Don't put it off. Time's going to be up soon. Don't be arrogant that Gentiles are being saved and Jews are not. But uh, instead, our application is we should be thankful people. God has opened our hearts and our eyes and our heads to believe in Jesus, to know Him. Uh, God has shut up all in disobedience so that He may show mercy to all. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments. Unfathomable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord who has become his counselor? Who has first given to him that it might be paid back? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever and ever. So as we see that we are living in this time of great opportunity for us Gentiles, we should be thankful. Or Salvation is provided. Whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. I hope and trust in Jesus. Before time's up. End events are sealed. They are going to be soon, when the mystery is over. And they are going to be bittersweet. Thunders are sealed, the end is soon, and third, the end will be bittersweet. Verses 8 through 11. Then the voice which I heard from heaven, I heard again speaking with me, saying, Go, take the book which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel telling him to give me the book, the little book. And he said to me, take it and eat it. It will make your stomach bitter, but in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. So I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it. And in my mouth it was sweet as honey. And when I had eaten it, my stomach was made bitter. And they said to me, you must prophesy again concerning many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. The end will be bittersweet. John was directed to eat a scroll. The voice that told him not to write now tells him to eat of the book, the information. Ezekiel, he was told to do the same thing in Ezekiel chapter 2 and verse uh, eight, open your mouth and eat what I'm giving you. Three, one, son of man, eat what you find. Eat this scroll and go speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth and he fed me the scroll. And it was bittersweet for John. Uh, Ezekiel and Jeremiah also ate scrolls of bittersweet predictions. Uh, here in Ezekiel 
chapter 2, verse 10, the very end, it was full of lamentations and mourning and woe. So it was bitter. But 3.3, 3, he said to me, Son of man, feed your stomach and fill your body with the scroll which I'm giving you. Then I ate and it was sweet as honey in my mouth. So it was sweet on one hand and bitter on the other. And then he's predicted in verse 11, he's told to prophesy again. Tell things about the future concerning many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. And these are going to be bitter and sweet predictions that he will be making. In chapters 11 through 18, he will predict other events that will be taking place throughout the seven-year tribulation period, but particularly the last three and a half years. So there's a lot of uh, going over the same time and giving different perspectives on it. Uh, 11.18 is one of his predictions. The nations were enraged. Notice the nations. And your wrath came. The time for the dead to be judged. The time for the reward. Your bond servants. That's the sweet part. The saints and those who fear your name. The small and the great. And the bitter part to destroy those who destroy the earth. Uh, he's going to predict things about the tribulation period. And then in verses 19 to 22, he will be predicting what's going to happen after the tribulation period. The coming of our Lord, the millennial kingdom, the final rebellion that God stops and thwarts. And then the new heaven and the new earth. Uh, look at chapter 20 and verse... 15, the bitter part that's coming up. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, it was thrown into the lake of fire. In chapter 22, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them as those who believe in Jesus. And they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. And he shall wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. Well, that's a sweet part. It's coming that he is now being asked to prophesy about. He was to prophesy about all peoples and nations and tongues. And we find in chapter 13 that there will be people from all the people's nations, tongues, who will be following the Antichrist and will worship his image, universal. But we also find uh, that there people from all <laughs> are going to believe and turn to Christ as well. They will persevere and be rewarded. And he's to prophesy concerning kings. The role of kings is world leaders, national leaders is quite frequent throughout this book. In chapter 19, 19, I saw the beast, that's the Antichrist, and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war against him who sat on the horse. And against his army, the beast was seized. And verse 21, the rest were killed with sword which came out of his mouth of him who sat on the horse. And all the birds were filled with their flesh. Jesus is going to come and take out the kings. So how do we apply these things? The end events are sealed soon and bittersweet. The thunders are sealed and we need to trust God to guide us through the unknown future. The end is soon. Let's thank God for salvation for us Gentiles. And what about the end being bittersweet? We need to warn unbelievers of the wrath that is to come. And we need to welcome the warmth that's going to come by being with Jesus. If you 
We're living in the Ukraine today. Someone would have warned you about the coming invasion. And if you knew people in your neighborhood that didn't know about the coming invasion, you would tell them. It's just the right thing to do, to warn people. There is a more terrible, much more terrible event coming on this world. The rise of the Antichrist. The judgments God will bring and we need to warn people. Because if people come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior, they have a promise that they will escape the wrath that is to come. We don't need to be around for this terrible time on earth. We can be delivered from it and from the lake of fire through trusting in Jesus. And it is our responsibility as it was Ezekiel's as a watchman to tell people of the coming destruction on this world. God told Ezekiel, if you tell them that then you won't be at fault if they do not turn to me because it, you've done your job. But if you don't tell them, you know, you're held accountable for not telling them if they don't respond because they never heard. God has a promise for us believers. that before he comes and lands on the Mount of Olives, Jesus is going to come in the air. If we believe in Christ, we will go to be with him forever. That's a wonderful thing. Now in Kiev, our missionaries uh, there sought to get on a plane to leave the country and the uh, cyber techni technicians of Russia uh, damaged the GPS systems, the planes in the airport in Kiev, and they were able to, to leave. When it's time for us to leave, for the rapture. Uh, no one <laughs> is going to be able to thwart Jesus. Um, GPS. Um, guidance system. We're going to go right to him. Isn't that wonderful? Let's be ready. Lord, help us to be ready. May you come quickly. Take your church out of here to unravel these terrible events, bittersweet. Thank you, Lord, for giving us this info. And God, the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, we need to be prayerful. We need to be fervent in prayer. Guide each of us, Lord, to get together with other believers that we might pray together for one another, that we might pray for the lost, that God would give us boldness. May we be like the early church, that when they were threatened, they prayed and God gave them boldness to tell others about Christ. Oh Lord, lead each of us to have others that we can team with and pray with. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen.